record. So <clears throat> you'll all see up at the top of your screen a uh, privacy notice just about the recording, uh, and this will be available to everybody to view afterwards. So um, just to start off, as I said, uh, John and Paddy, if you knock on your cameras there, you can take over from here and I'll open the slideshow and the boys will take away. So hopefully you all enjoy it and we'll talk again later. Thank you. Cheers, Damien. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay, so um, as Damien said, this is our second night of, of workshops and webinars. So tonight's focus is on the, the child player and the child coach and it's all specific towards that age group. So everything that we, we talk about tonight is specific to that age. and whether you're an assistant coach or a main coach, all the stuff that will come up tonight is relevant to yourself and you can alter and change it to whatever team you're working with, which is very important. Um, so when we look just at the, the aims of the session and the, the program, everything that we do in our, in our workshops and stuff, we look at the terrorist principles. And this is something that is ran between Lancer J and ourselves that we, we use these other principles for all our training sessions, whether it's in schools or clubs and all our coaching courses and these are some of the points we'll be kicking through during the night so we'll come back to that later on but everything will relay back to the first principles and what good coaching is the aim of the session will be to look at different skills to develop the child player uh, examine different types of games to develop the skills of the child player and most importantly use the step model to expand them games so how do we expand them to the appropriate level of the team we're working with so if you just see here just a quick slide of sample skills per age group so we've under eight tens and twelves and you can see here these are taken from the fundu pack which most of you will be fairly aware of or the e-learning site on the ga website and um, this is just a list of skills a recommended area where the skills should be taught now this isn't set in stone i would advise all clubs to look at their age groups and see well what age group are we coaching the high catch at what age group are we coaching the block down at and maybe what's appropriate to your to your players and that's very important so again the, the hook kick could move back to under eight the the crouch lift could move to under 10. It all depends on your club and your situation and the players you're working with. But the important thing is that you have a plan looking forward. What skills you're going to work with, with your players. And that's really, really important. So say it's just a guide for yourselves. But again, I'd advise all clubs to work together on that and, and have a plan going forward for their, for their age groups. And that will change from year to year, but there is a focus plan, which is very, very important. So I'm going to play a little video now from um, Paddy Butler the ex-director uh, of coaching at Hurling in Ireland. Huge experience. He would be probably, he, he would be a, a master in child coaching and some really good points he, he put together for us for the, the programme tonight. So let's have a quick listen to this. Good morning, Damien and Paddy. And thanks for the opportunity of speaking to you and your coaches in Longford. My name is Paddy Butler. I've been a coach now for 50 years, primary school teacher. That's so why I'm involved with coaching children, um, both in school and in the club and at county development level for a long, long time. So today I want to help you on your road of becoming an expert in uh, coaching children. It is a wonderful time to coach children. Um, they are so coachable now and the way the education systems and things have gone, children are so coachable and they want to be coached. And of course, it's a great privilege for us uh, that parents will trust us with their children in our clubs and in our counties. So today I'm taking my team. I, I always loved having coaching models. So the model I'm taking today is from a book called Human Givens by Joe Griffin and Ivan Terrell. And they outline the children's great needs are stimulation, attention, and challenge. Now, these are human needs. They're not privileges. They're not add-ons. And as we know in our clubs, uh, the GA um, provides for children's needs for generation upon generation. The GA is about community. It's about uh, carrying on our cultural inheritance and promoting Gaelic games and a Gaelic way of life. So stimulation is a human need and it will be found legally or illegally. Thanks be to God, as we arrived into the world, the clubs were already formed and we all came into this world 
where games were organized for us and training was organized for us. So stimulation now is a need. A ball is a marvelous stimulant and being with your comrades and that. So to understand that the basic first need of, of human beings is stimulation some excitement in my life outside of myself somewhere to go somewhere to be um where i can be with my own age group and in a safe environment where there's excitement and where there's challenge and i can let myself go and i can forget the cares of the world so children would have better lives if everybody understood that the children's children's needs are stimulation, attention, and challenge. So from our perspective, with the privilege comes the responsibility. So I'm there to provide stimulation uh, in an organized way. So the ball and the gear and the field and the facilities, they're all very stimulating things. Can I play for my team? Can I get on the jersey? Uh, where are we playing next? Who are we playing next? And in these straightened times, we all know how much how much we miss the games, the real games um, in our own fields, and then the televised games from the big the big excitement that we need in our own lives. Human beings, children especially, need the attention of a mature adult. The child needs the attention of a mature male adult in order to know what it is to be a proper adult in the world. And the child also needs the female role, the mature female, um, who by their very presence is affecting the child in a really healthy way. We know that's not every child's experience of the world. So when they come to the field and they meet mature adult, um, males and females who are there for the good of the children, it has an enormous effect on how they will live their lives. And you know yourself from your childhood, the way some people influenced you and they left a mark on you that, uh, that we're forever grateful for. So the children need this attention, the attention that they can't find on the phone and they can't find on uh, the media. They need this in, in real form, that they meet you, um, an adult who cares about them, who cares about parish, who cares about community, and who has their, their development and their good at heart. And what gives us more delight than some of our players going on to represent their parish? both in their club games and going on to play for their county and the development squads. So the more mature I am and the more selfless I am, the better chance the child has of maturing. So I need to understand what's age appropriate. And if I train the under sixes as I do in my club, then the activities must be appropriate for under sixes. And so for the eights and the tens up along, what's age appropriate? Now, when children are at home and they're eating at the table, everything is age appropriate. The little child in the high chair is getting um, soft foods. We don't give them the knife and the fork. They're not ready for that. It'd be inappropriate. We give them the tools that they're able to manage. And so our expectation of children should be very much measured. Um, by their age and their capacity. They shouldn't be pushed on too soon and neither should they be uh, neglected. So that's just a video there from, um, from Paddy Butler and the three things that Paddy would have, uh, I suppose, emphasised there would be stimulating kids, um, I suppose, giving them attention and challenging, challenging them. And there are three things that we're going to try and give you activities now that can go through all those areas. And one of the things I would have picked up big time from that video was, can we be the coach that made the influence on the child that we remember? We all have a coach or a teacher that we remember from when we were young that worked with us. And that's who we want to be all the time. Whatever team or team we work with, we want to be that coach who made the impression. And I suppose we're going to go through a group of things now just on the next slide. 
which um, is the family of games. These family of games will stimulate, will give the child attention and will challenge them. And all these games are areas that you can work with your players and develop with your players to, to give them that attention, to challenge them and stimulate them. So that's very, very important. So we're going to start off first with, with some chasing games, a video on some chasing games, which will show you how to develop them. Games called Stuck in the Mud. And this is how we teach it. And stop there. Okay, volunteer. All right. Excellent. Put you in the bib. All right. As James is running around, if he touches you, you have to open your legs really wide. And another player who hasn't been touched has to go under your legs. And then you can go. Okay, jogging around anywhere in the area. Go. Get him. Yep. Open your legs. Open your legs. Can you get under? Good. Yeah, good. Open your legs. Go underneath. Someone help him. Someone help him. Excellent. Oh, I've got both of you. Both in. Keep going. Keep going. Keep getting him. Good. Chasing games can be used with all age groups. As a starting point, have a maximum of one quarter of the group on with three quarters being chased. These games are all based off stuck in the mud or tie. And the following explains the various adaptions that can be used to free those tight. This game is called Bulldog. It is used as a warm-up activity. It emphasizes running, agility, evasion, teamwork, and decision-making. The key coaching point for this game is to encourage the players to run at angles and change direction by using the foot plant. is a fun game to develop the solo technique. Mark out a grid, 15 meters by 15 meters. Six players attempt to solo across the grid. Two players act as defenders and attempt to tag the soloing players. Once a player has been tagged, they must leave the game. The soloing players continue over and back until all have been tagged. Rotate the defenders and repeat the game. Okay, so that group of videos went through um, chasing games and we all would have used these games before. And I suppose, when would we use these games is the question. The warm-up is the prime time to use these games. But what are we trying to achieve in these games is the big thing. And... and one thing we're trying to achieve, obviously, is as a pulse raiser to warm up the body and warm up the muscles. Second of all is to work on them fundamental movement skills. The movement skills that take the agility, balance, coordination, running, jumping, all these fundamental moves that we need, these skills we need to play the game. If we don't have these fundamental movement skills, we won't be able to perform the high skills down the line. So when you look at the sidestep, the feint, tackling, moving off left and right. So chasing games are really good but they're only really good when all players are playing. So when you're playing these games, 
I would advise you all to, to make sure that kids aren't stepping out, that we don't play a game of bulldog or stuck in the mud that someone is out of the game. Maybe kid, give the kids lives. Give them you know, five lives. When you're caught five times, you can sit out. And then if they have to sit out, then they, they have a skill on the outside to come back into the game. But play the games really short and, uh, really short and snappy. Another way of doing the chasing games would be is do them in small groups. Don't just have 30 players and two taggers. Maybe have four different groups and four taggers in small little areas. So you have one tagger per five for, for five people. And then they're getting loads of chances to get caught, loads of chances to get free. They're getting really warmed up. And then after that, you're chasing games. You can use at all age groups, which is really, really important. 13, 14, 15, but especially under 8s, 10s and 12s. You can bring in your skills as they've done there in the solar tag. You can bring in your high catch to free a person stuck in the mud. You can bring in a, a pickup. You can bring in a punt kick. You can start working maybe on your physical development. So players can wait maybe in a, in a tall plank position while they're waiting to be freed. They can stand on one leg, work on their balance and their coordination. They can do little squats while they're waiting. They can do um, any of the exercise you had in the video there and the variations of games. So chasing games are really good for working the fundamental movement skills, but also working on the skills. And what chasing games are good for is introducing skills, bringing the ball into them, making sure all players are involved all the time, which is the big thing, that they're all involved all the time, they're getting warmed up, but they're, they're working on them fundamental movement skills and they're working on their Gaelic football skills as well, which is really, really important. So what we're going to nip on to next, we're going to tip on to target games and how would we, we would use target games to develop kids and develop further on our coaching sessions for our players. This is a target game to develop the punt kick technique. Mark out a grid 25 metres by 25 metres. Place a number of cones across the middle of the grid. Divide the group into teams of three to five players. Give one or two footballs to each team. The player in possession attempts to strike one of the cones in the middle of the grid using the punt kick. For each successful strike, Award one point. Extra points may be awarded for knocking a cone over or for a clean catch if the ball is struck too far. Alternatively, points may be awarded for kicking the ball through gaps in the cones. This is a target game to develop the hook kick. Place four cones in a 10 metre square formation. Inside the 10 metres, mark out a circle. Mark out a line of cones, 15 metres, 20 metres and 25 metres to either side of the grid. Divide the players into two groups, one group at either side. Beginning at one side and behind the 15 metre line, the players attempt to land the ball in the square or circle. Award one point for every kick that lands in the square and three points for every kick that lands in the circle. Progress the drill by moving the players back behind the 20 meter lines and the 25 meter lines as they become more proficient. Okay, could make, everyone just make sure they have their, their mics muted, please. Just press the mute button because there's a good bit of feedback coming through there. A um, couple of questions there just in the, in, the, um, in the question area. So one of them was from William. William, how would you keep the kids uh, entertained who got first? What I'd always try and do, William, is make sure they go on with the other person or also maybe give them lives. So every child that gets caught has five lives. So every time they're caught, they have a, a life has gone. And you can just play the game for maybe two or three minutes and then they probably won't lose their five lives to them. If they get their five lives caught, they can go on also. Or also, you can maybe pair them up with a really strong player. So if it's a weak player that's always getting caught, you can all obviously pair, pair a strong and a weak player up together who's catching uh, different, different participants in it. But also, you can have them doing a skill, a skill on the side. But I would try and give them lives and make them try and use up their lives because the games are going to really sh short and snappy. So kids won't really remember. Just play with their lives. I'm not on now. I'll get another go again. So again, even try and pair up the, the, the strong and the weaker kids. 
Another question there from someone about regard I just didn't get their name was um Aiden. Yeah, all videos and resources will be put up at the end. So Damien will be will be showing you at the end how to how to contact the resources and go through it. So John's just gonna do a little bit just on the um the target games now just before this video comes in. So are you there, John? I'm here, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, just for me, target games are really designed to challenge the skills and the techniques that your players have already learned. So you're kind of working on something here that you've already done in the sessions building up to it. At a young age, these games are usually performed with no pressure on the player. So you're giving them time on the ball to perfect the skill, to enjoy it. So they're really fun games as well for the players and they're something that they'll, they'll really want to be doing. Um, as time goes on, um, you can add in various time constraints and conditions, usually as the players get older and the, the, sc the skills have developed. Uh, some of these games, for me, would be done at under, for under 12 level, would definitely be done as a warm up. And, but for some of the younger age groups, these type of games could make up the main bones of your session. Okay. So again, you're after seeing a good few games there um, highlighted. And again, it's to give us as many children touches on the ball. You see there in a lot of the games, the bullseye, all the children had a ball. They're getting as many touches, many kicks on the ball as possible. Other examples that I would use as well would be something like a crossbar challenge. You know, that could be done either at the beginning or the end of a session. Again, it's a target game. Another one that I would have used down through the years, which is great fun, is you get a large yoga ball or balloon ball, and the kids are just trying to kick at that ball. They're developing accuracy all the time um as well for kicking uh, again get nets on a goal you can purchase nets with holes in the nets where the children are aiming for certain parts of the goal now again in these target games you can weight it that each hole on it is worth a certain number the kids themselves always tend to go for the top corner but perhaps you want them going low and hard so for the scores that are got low and hard you give extra scope points for those so again, these are great games to use. And as I said, for under 12, definitely as a warm up or a cool down for the younger games will form the basis of your session. Thanks, John. It's going to nip into a video now, another, another game that a uh, target game. Hi, O'Connor, Lockhart GA here. I'm here to talk to you about my favorite game, which is to find a goal game. Find a goal game is a brilliant game to work on many different skills. The primary skills that are used in this game are kick passing the ball or score, kick, kick for a score and head, head up movement. Really important. Secondary skills that can be used to develop in this game are fist pass, block, tackle, high catch, evasion skills and goalkeeping. As said, it's be, it would be used between under 7 all the way to under 13. How would you set up the game? As you see here in the diagram, a 30 by 20 grid with a number of goals spread out along around the, the area using poles or cones, preferably poles. The game can be used between six players to 30 players. The equipment that you need, cones and poles, bibs, and a football between every pair. What are the conditions of this game? Players have to kick the ball through the goal to their partner standing on the other side. When they do that, they must run to another goal and do the same thing. Players have to use their four steps, bounce and solo, and travelling from goal to goal, depending on what age group you're working with. The first, say the first team to five scores wins the game. Now, the progressions in this game. If you're using the kick pass as your skill, it could be two points for a pass that is kicked and caught in the chest, or one point if a pass is kicked and it's caught after one bounce. Another progression is you can change the width of the goals you're kicking the ball into, passing or shooting into. Or you can also change the distance, maybe by placing some small cones in between the goals, different distances. So one goal might be a 10 meter kick, the next one might be a 20 meter kick, and you can give different points for that. You can also give scores for every goal shooting or point scoring. So they have to kick the ball over the bar or they have to kick the ball nice and low, like a daisy cutter shot, nice and low, shooting into the corner of the goals to their partner the other side. Another progression here as you see in the diagram is 
admin blockers. You have two players from one of the teams, and they're blockers. That's their job to run around and try and block the other players getting scores. You can also use two players from their team as tacklers. And it's their job that they can only dispossess people when they're traveling from goal to goal. Finally, what you can do then, you can add in some goalkeepers. So a goalkeeper can be in the goal and they have to try and kick the ball through the goal to get a score and goalkeeper to practice the goalkeeping skills. And then you can actually mix up the goalkeepers, tacklers and blockers and needs bees. You could have two goalkeepers, one tackler and two blockers, depending on what you want to do. The best thing about this game then is that you can use array of skills for this. The fist pass, high catch or solo. So, for instance, if we're an under eight coach and we want to use the fist pass, we can use all these progressions up there and just use the fist pass. Or if we're under 10, we can work on the high catch. We can use the high catch skill here. At the block, and have to stop the high catch. Or we have to throw the ball through the goals for a high catch to far side of the goal. Other variations there we could do if we were working maybe on just our, our, our body catch for under eights, we could easily use this that they just have to throw the ball. And to score, they can throw the ball through the goals and catch the ball on the far side. So again, it's so it's a, it's a game that has so many variations from so many different age groups. And again, going back to your under 12, you can use, obviously, whichever kick pass you want, the swerve kick, the hook kick, or the punt kick. Another variation of this game you see here in diagram two is, is the pitch is set up in a H shape. So we call it find a goal H. There is a goal in the middle. Then there is two goals in the south of the pitch and two goals in the north of the pitch, the top and the bottom of the pitch. The idea here is that you want to play games that are overloaded. So you would have max maybe of 10 players per pitch. Start off with a seven versus three, seven attackers versus three defenders. This game will really head heads up football and decision making. As every time a player gets a ball, he's loads of time on the ball. But if he goes to score a goal and it's blocked by one of the defenders, the three defenders with seven v three, then he has to heads up and change direction, look to pass somewhere else. So where does he go? So progressions in this game, players have to carry the ball through the goal to score. They can kick the ball through the goal to score. Other progressions then. So maybe when you go up to other age groups, you would look at maybe a 5v5 situation. Maybe at under 11. The big thing here is that after each score, the team keeps possession. So we have one football per pitch, the team keeps possession. So the second they get a score, whether it's with a kick pass or a hand pass or a high catch, whichever scheme they're using the game for, they turn heads up and try and go from their goal. So it's heads up football all the time. The scoring system, to get a score, the ball must be kicked or carried through the goal depending on what skill you're using. So we talked about that already with the fist pass, the high catch, the kick pass. So get it through the goal. Also, you can change it that maybe you award the same, same score for the same amount of passes the team might make. So if a team makes five passes before they get a score to get five points, you're working out of possession. Or obviously, you can change everything to weak side. So change everything to weak side hand pass, weak side kick pass. You can change it for scoring for points. Are scoring for goals. There's loads of different scoring variations in this game. What adaptions, I suppose, can be made for weaker and stronger players? You can constrain players to their weak foot or different types of kicks or different types of passes, different types of catches. Even. You can bring in a one hop, as I said earlier, one hop catch from a kick pass for the weaker players and a clean catch for the stronger players. That'll help your foot pass and catch it. Really good way of doing this is in your overloads, place your stronger players on the overload. So if it's four versus three or seven versus three, whatever numbers you have in your, in your grids, it will be three def three strong players against seven weak players. It's really challenging the strong players and it's giving the weaker players a chance to develop their skills and be also under pressure from a stronger player. Or maybe you, you make the stronger players the blockers. So that's the variations there for weaker and stronger players. How long should you play this game for? Normally, I would play this game first thing to five scores. It takes about maybe two minutes, two, three minutes, depending on, I suppose, your skill level and the defenders that are going on. What it does do is it gives you a chance to talk to the players and reset again and maybe change the skill if you want. When we look here at the question slide, which are really important when we're working on games to develop skills and develop players, it's what questions can be asked to the players during the game. So, like, what pass should you use in a certain situation? What is the best way to go past the player? Should I sold the ball first or should I take my four steps and bounce? 
what type of pass do the players prefer who are giving the ball to? So do they like the ball to the chest? Do they want a one half pass? Do they want the ball up nice and high? These are questions you can all ask your players. Or what should I do when I score one of the goals? That could be a question you ask. So if a player scores, what should you do then? Well, get your head up, look, and try and tack again. And get your head up, play your head up football, and look for another person down the other end of the field. Or how do I create space for someone else in the field as well? So you can ask is how could you create space? Do a move to, towards a player with the ball, or do a move away from to one of the corner goals that I'm the, an option for a kick pass. So these are all the questions you can ask players when playing the game. Finally, does the game align with the terrorist principles? So is the game tested and challenging? It definitely is tested and challenging. As it challenges many different techniques on strong and weak side, but it also challenges the technique from no pressure at the start where it's a target game, where a finder goal game is a target game, and then we bring in blockers, we bring in goalies, we bring in defenders, we bring in uh, tacklers, and that puts more pressure on. So every player is challenged in different ways. I, it definitely you is the players is a player centered and it, does it offer individual development? Yes, it does because you can put different additions to different players. They can have so many seconds on the ball. We talk about the countdown clock. You can overload the strong players and the weak players, so it is individually individual for individual development. Does it resemble the game? Yes, it is. It's all one big game. You can start off at your target game in the first game, kicking the ball through the goals with no defenders. Then you start bringing in defenders, goalies, and blockers. And then it goes to a full game where you have the five goals and it's 5v5 or 7v3. So it does resemble the game. Are all the players involved all the time with lots of touches? Yes, they're getting loads of touches as and the game is in pairs. Then when you go to the, the H game or the H goal game, they're getting plenty of touches and there's loads of decisions because there's loads of different goals to score into. But also, it's small-sided. And also, game-based activities provide you with a load of chances put decision making into the process for the players compared to drills so games are a great way of developing decision making finally is it enjoyable S should be enjoyable yes players love playing games and they also love scoring goals and points hope you enjoyed the game there's plenty of other variations you might be able to bring to this game but it's a game that I play with all all our coaching setups all the way from under 7 to under 13 and again hope you enjoyed it and hope you get something out of it Okay, everyone, that was just the, the find the goal game. And we're going to nip on to the court games now in a minute. But what I'd like to just reference there, just in the chat, Paulie referenced a the book there. Damien's put up a link to that uh, to that chat um, in, in the chat to the book. Next, we're going on to the court games. And the big thing about court games is, is that if you, if you set up a court game, this can be developed for the whole session, like in the find the goal game. So there's not a lot of setting up. You just set up your game and you can do all your warm games, every other activity in it. So court games are really, really important that you can develop and you'll see in the in the, the examples here. This is a fun game to develop the block down technique. Mark out a grid approximately 40 metres by 20 metres using cones. Divide the grid into four sections. Divide the players into pairs, one pair per section. One of each pair is a member of the same team. The team with the ball attempts to retain possession by kicking the ball from section to section. The opposing team attempts to block the kicks of their opponents. If the kick is blocked, that team gain possession. If the kick is successful, that team must be allowed to retain possession. This is a fun game to develop the reach catch. Mark out a triangle using cones as shown. Divide the players into groups of four, one ball per group. One player is positioned at each of the cones, while the fourth is the piggy in the middle. The players at the cones must pass the ball to each other for each to perform the reach catch. The player in the middle attempts to intercept the ball. If successful, the player whose pass was intercepted becomes the new piggy in the middle. Begin by throwing the ball above the head and after a set time change to fist the ball to head height. Continue the game 
for a set period of time. This is a modified game to develop the hook kick. Mark out a playing area 20 meters by 30 meters. Mark out a goal area at either end. Divide the players into two equal teams. A permanent goalkeeper is not allowed. The players may only solo and hook kick the ball. A score is awarded only when a player hook kicks the ball over the bar. Just going to go into another game now. Hello, this is John Higgins here. Today I'm going to talk you through a game called No Man's Land. Now, this game may be very familiar to a lot of coaches out there, but I hope by the end of my little video here that I will be able to give you a few different variations on the game, primarily using the step model. No Man's Land primarily focuses on kicking, catching and communication. However, it, the game can be very easily altered to work on shooting, tackling, teamwork and a whole host of other skills as well. To play the game, you will need at least six players. Footballs, sets of bibs and cones. As a, you can see on the chart here in front of me, poles and portable goals can be used in some variations of the game. I will go through these variations as we saw through the video, and I will also get Damien to attach a document which will further explain these games and will also have additional activities which you may be able to use in your sessions. These additional activities will ensure that this game is a game that can be used between under eight and minor and with huge amounts of benefits for each age group. The setup of this game is quite simple, as you can see in the diagram. You set out two distinct rectangles one for team a and one for team b with a smaller rectangle in the middle which will be designated as no man's land no man's land as you can explain to the players is an area where the players cannot enter and the ball must not enter this area either you as the coach will give the ball to one team so for example you give the ball to a player in team a the team a must try and kick the ball over no man's land and try and land the ball into team B's zone. If the ball hits the ground, you may award a point to team A. Team B then have possession of the ball and they will try and do the same and kick a pass over no man's land and land it inside team A's zone. However, if one of the opposition players catch the ball, well then it is a no is a point to the team who catches the ball. There are various scoring systems when playing this game, so feel free to come up with your own scoring system to whatever suits your situation. Also when playing this game, I make sure that every player on a particular team gets the chance to at least kick the ball. So therefore, once a player has kicked the ball, he may not kick another pass, even if he has caught the ball, until every other member on the team has kicked it. This will ensure that players are getting numerous touches on the ball. Another variation to this game and a way of keeping all the players engaged and active and making sure they're getting more touches in catching and kicking is to add a second ball. Now that variation can be used in all the games that we will play here today. It is also a good idea to rotate the players around the grid so as to give the players a different perspective and also to give them a greater opportunity to catch and feel the ball. If we now look at diagram number two, I have made one very small alteration to the initial game setup. I have placed one member of the opposition team in the opposite zone. The role of this opposition player is to still work with his original team. Like for example, in the top grid, you will see five X's and one green. 
the green player will still work with the green team. His role is to try and disrupt the players in the top zone from catching the ball. So therefore you are adding in a contested catch. If we move on now from diagram number two onto diagram number three, we will see that I have changed the setup of this game by adding in a set of portable goals. The set of portable goals will be used for the second part of this game. For the first part of this game, I will just play a 3v2 game with the players. So three players in the top will work with the two players in the bottom. This team of three at the top and two in the bottom must maintain possession. After one or two passes, which will be determined by you, the players must kick a pass over no man's land to find a teammate, who again must work in tandem, communicate with each other, pass the ball around, and work the ball back over no man's land. To move this game on to the next level, we then bring in the set of portable goals. When the two defenders, as we will call them, work the ball into the three forwards, the forwards' task then will be either to shoot for a goal or shoot for a point. Again, whichever you decide to work on. If you're going for goals, well, therefore you can add in another player and utilize your goalkeeper in this situation. If the two backs dispossess or successfully block the forwards, you can award extra points to the defending team if you are trying to work on that particular skill. Another variation to this game would be that once the defender passes the ball into the three forwards, that you could allow the defender to follow his pass, therefore creating a 4 v 2 situation and a player coming at speed to support the attack. If we now look at the last diagram, diagram number four, you will see that I've inserted two sets of portable goals. When I'm doing this, I normally just use poles because we always don't have access to two sets of portable goals. So poles work perfectly for this as well. In this game, by using the two sets of poles, you're just giving the forwards two targets to aim for. Therefore, if they get bottled up on one side of the field, that you're giving them the opportunity to switch the play to possibly to the far side of the field. So again, you're working on your diagonal ball, your switching of play, and again, like the last number of games, you are encouraging them to play with their head up, to keep the head up, look and see where the pass is, and see where the space is. That's all the games I'm going to go through with you this evening. Again, if I could just draw your attention to the step model again, all of these games can be altered even further by using the step model. Like we have taken a very simple, basic, no man's land game that traditionally would have been used at under eights and under tens, and we have made multiple changes to the game, which has given the game a new lease of life. Now, various coaches have done this down through the years. Terence McWilliams has a document out which has loads of games and variations for No Man's Land. Some of them are here and some of them are in the document that Damien is going to send on to you as well. So again, if you stick by the step model, there are multiple, multiple opportunities to change games for you, as you can see there tonight. As I've said, this is a very enjoyable game for players. It's a game that they will be looking to play in most sessions with you. As a coach, it gives you great scope to work on various different skills. It's very easy to set up. And again, it's working on things that you really want to work at at your own particular age group. So, as I said, we're primarily focusing on under 8, 10 and 12 here tonight. But again, as you can see from what we've talked about tonight, that this game is definitely applicable to all age groups, particularly from 8s to 18s. Look, I hope you got something out of this evening. Um, very best of luck with it. And if you have any queries or any questions, please don't hesitate to get in contact and ask. Now, just w one little thing that uh, I forgot to mention in that video was something that we could use with our under eights again that 
instead of setting or separating the teams into team A and team B, that we could use it as a cooperative game and have split the children up in, on either side, but that they work in tandem with each other so that the players are trying to accurately kick the ball across no man's land and pick a pass. So therefore, there's no sense of competition. You could put a, a, a target on the players if you wanted to, to see how many accurate passes you could get in a row. But again, as I said, with the younger age group, it would be important to get them working together and just to try and get the ball passed around the square. And again, it develops that skill of kicking and of catching in a non-competitive type of situation for that age group. I just, um, through the game so far, I hope everyone's seeing the pattern of using step, but also, I suppose, changing each game to, to, to look at different skills different variants and putting pressure on challenging the players as we said at the start, challenging every player. So the last group of games we're going to look at is, is condition games and full games. So it does exactly what it says in the tin. Condition games, you put conditions into the game. Full games, you're playing full um, full numbers. These games aren't just condition games on teams. You can condition players to different situations as well. So that's something to think about when you're looking at these games. Condition, give, giving different players different conditions when they're playing them. So we have another little game here now that's going to go through full games and condition games for you. Just click up there, Damien. So again, looking at full and condition games, just Damien, you'll have to move down to the, click the video there. Don't think he's getting to it. You might just go on to the next slide, Damien. might come back to the video in a minute. We could. There you go. See, you're having a couple of issues with that video there. So if you want to nip on to the next slide, Damien, and come back to it, maybe. Sorry, Paddy. It was just a, an issue with, uh, I couldn't unmute myself. I couldn't get it back to the beginning to unmute. Oh, so good, lovely. Damien Sheridan from Longford GA here. And this is my favourite game. My game is based off 1v1, 2v2, 3v3, or three goals in. This is a quick look at what it looks like. And I will share it again with you later. This document is in your resource pack and explains everything about the game, how it should be ran to make the most out of the activity and get the most benefit for your players. This is what my game looks like on paper. I will now break it down into smaller sections and talk you through each section and explain as best I can how the game plays out. This game is to primarily work on goal scoring and point scoring as well as goalkeeping. Additional skills worked on can be soloing, bouncing, tackling, players taking on each other and it also forms the foundations of team play where you're working with one or two partners and then also decision making. This game and the following conditions are designed for players aged 7 to 12 years old. The area required for these games are approximately the end line to just beyond the 21. This game can be played with any number of players from 2 to an unlimited amount and the equipment required are cones, or poles, footballs, ideally one per player, at least one for every two players, and there are no need for bibs. We'll talk about this later. As a goalkeeper, I get a lot of feedback from clubs that the standard of player they have playing in goals is not deemed by them to be good enough. This is a great opportunity to allow players to play in the position, get used to it, achieve success in playing in goals, and ideally become a goalkeeper of the future. Ultimately, the reason clubs do not have a player that they feel capable of playing in goals is because they don't start at the right point. The goalkeeping position is filled as one of the last positions as opposed to one of the first five positions. I will now take you through the pitch setup. 
I want you to focus on the left hand side of the screen where you see stage one. So there are two small pitches there. Those two pitches would be replicated the full width of the field. So you would have a, a set of goals on the 13 meter line and a set of goals on the 21 meter line. These can be cones or poles and that pitch would be replicated all the way across the field. The width of that pitch might be anything from 10 to 15 meters, depending on the number of pitches that you require based on your players. I will now go through some of the initial rules, some of which carry through all the various stages of the game. The players are the referees of their own game. This gives them ownership and responsibility. There is no need to use bibs. As games are very small-sided, kids need to understand who's on their team and who's not, as opposed to what colour of bib that that person might be wearing. It also makes it easier when moving from 1v1 to 2v2 and 3v3. There are no need to be swapping bibs. Shots that are kicked, anything above waist high, cannot count as a score. The reason being, shots like this in normal matches have a higher increase of being saved, therefore we don't want to promote that. The games start as 1v1 with goals on the 13 and the 21, where players shoot from their goal line and it's mainly shots and saves. Players should be encouraged to practice various types of kicks and practice diving left and right to make the saves. This can be used as a warm-up where players use both their left and their right feet. For stage two, both goalkeepers bring their cones back about 10 kids paces, which is about six meters. This will now create a field where we have three zones. The first game we play is shooting on the run. So the goalkeeper on the end line side of the field will carry the ball without playing it as far as the 21 and take a shot from there, not crossing the 21. The reason the player does not play the ball is to encourage them to keep their head up see what the goalkeeper is doing and pick their spot. At this point, only shots below knee height count as scores and both players should be encouraged to keep the score of their own game. Now introduce the bounce where they play the ball on the start of the second zone. So when the ball comes back to their hand, they will be shooting on their fifth or sixth step. Again, this reinforces at an early stage to travel with the ball and play heads up football. You can now introduce the solo, the same as the bounce previously. At this age, players should be continuously encouraged to take shots off both feet. We will now move to stage three, where we introduce point scoring. Nine to 12 year olds should be scoring from the back end of zone two. Seven to 10 year olds should be allowed to move slightly further on and score from either the front of zone two or the middle of zone two. This is a great way of practicing the hook kick and to build a player's confidence to take their score when the opportunity arises. This stage of the game should be played for set periods of time, where one period is played solely on the right foot and the next period solely on the left foot. This is to encourage players to kick off both feet and to give the coaching team many opportunities to observe their players off both sides and allow them to help players improve on their weaker side in particular. Obviously, shots of the weaker side should be allowed to be made closer to the goals. We are now moving on to stage four and the introduction of pressure. It is very important when introducing pressure that is done at the right developmental age. Some kids of nine or ten can be very, very good, whereas some other kids can be quite weak and pressure is just too much at this stage. So please use your coaching judgment as regards your own group in this regard. As a rule of thumb, I would not introduce pressure until a player understands what a good tackle is and what a foul is. If they don't understand this, then we are potentially reinforcing poor habits at an early age, and this can then result in poor tackle technique when they do get to the age of 10, 11, 12, when it does become important. This game is still played as 1v1, where the attacker starts at their goal and the defender starts in zone two. The attacker must take on the defender, cross the back line of zone two, and shoot when they get into zone three. Players swap roles and come back the other way. Some conditions that can be added here is that the defender can only tackle with one arm or tackle with no arms, body only. This is to promote good footwork on the tackle and triple scores can be awarded to the attacker for scores off the weaker side. At this stage, a shot clock should be introduced of five to eight seconds that shots must be taken within that time or else it's a turnover. Again, this is to promote directness with taking on the player. Stage four can now evolve into 2v2, where each side has a goalkeeper, therefore a 1v1 situation out in the middle of the field. This is to promote trying to score against the goalkeeper 
while also being under pressure by a defender. If you look to the pitch on the right of stage four, you will see that the defender starts on the goal line beside the goalkeeper, where the attacker has a couple of metres of a head start. The goalkeeper shouts go, the attacker takes on with the ball, the defender chasing after, and the attacker tries to shoot, going off their right foot or their left foot. The defender that has chased back now becomes the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper becomes the attacker, and the previous attacker becomes the defender. These changes can be made each time to keep players fresh and always give the attacker the advantage. We now move to stage five, and I would suggest that most of these changes are mainly suitable for 11 and 12 year olds. So the first of the three pitches above is still a 2v2, where both teams have a fly goalkeeper with 1v1 in the centre. This means that on defence or attack, the, the fly goalkeeper can double up to provide a 2v1 or a 2v2. In this situation, double scores can be awarded off a turnover. This is to encourage players winning the ball back and attacking quickly. The middle pitch above evolves into three goals in, where you have a goalkeeper and three outfield players who all start in the middle zone. Once the first person wins the ball, the other two become defenders, where one has to be in zone one and the other in zone two. This is to ensure the attacker is not doubled up and that the defenders work on communication about which zone they're picking up. In these games, the goalkeeper is the referee and should call all fouls by defenders. Any foul is an automatic score. This should encourage discipline in the double-up tackle if you decide to allow that, and it promotes ball control when under pressure. The final pitch above is a 3v3 game, where a goalkeeper is in both goals, 2v2 in the middle. This can evolve into fly keepers and all the other conditions for the 2v2 game we talked about previously. There are numerous adaptions that can be used in these games to cater for the weaker or stronger player such as pairing players of similar ability against each other, so they're both challenged. Weaker players can have smaller goals. Stronger players have bigger goals. Stronger players might only use their weak side. And some games can be played as an overload with a 3v2, where two strong players are against three weaker players. How do we know when to stop the game for a rest or to provide feedback? Once the tempo drops or the players start messing is usually a good sign. I would suggest that these games should last no more than 60 seconds and probably only 30 to 40 seconds with breaks of 10 to set 10 to 20 seconds in between to allow the kids to go at max tempo all the time how do you know when to change a rule or a condition to a game ask yourself have the players got good at it rules and condition changes should only be introduced to promote or improve something not just to add variety if you get your matchups correct players will be challenged all the time and you will have less need to freshen things up by changing rules or conditions. What other activities might complement this game? Shooting to corners in the main or portable goals, trying to hit a tyre that's hanging from the crossbar, or a traffic cone that's placed in the corner. Target games like knock the cone. Stationary near-hand tackling activities, and any small-sided invasive games will all help and complement this activity. How does this game match up against the tourist principles? T. Is it testing and challenging the players at their level? Particularly if you can get into the habit of matching players off against each other of similar abilities, then your whole group will be tested and challenged all the time, and a rising tide will rise all boats. U. Do we understand that the player is at the centre of everything? These games give great opportunities for coaches to observe their players in multiple situations and in quick succession. Therefore, decisions can be made on spot and fix. Where is this player need correction? And what feedback am I going to provide to make an impact? Or does it resemble the game? This is the original form of the game. It's how we all started to play, and it's how motivated kids continue to play in their own time, in back gardens and schoolyards around the country. A, are all players involved all the time with lots of touches and decisions? 1v1 and 2v2 are the ultimate games for involvement and touches. S should be enjoyable. Once introduced, you will find your player will really love this game. And if done at the start of every training, I would doubt you will ever have any more latecomers. The question you are always asked is, coach, when are we playing the game? When is the match? Well, now your answer is, as soon as you come to training, we're into the match. So that's my game. Thanks for listening. 
and I hope you get many hours and years of enjoyment out of this game. Brilliant stuff, Damon. Um, just something that's kind of clicked in my head while we were going through there was, I know when we go to a club and, and maybe Monday evening is a big evening for underage football or Sunday morning and all age groups are, are, are training at the same time and setting up games like this doesn't take that much setting up. All you got to do is set up your pitch. So the first thing I'd always do going to a session is whatever game you're working on, set up your pitches and use that for everything. Use that for your, your, your target game. Use that for your chasing game. Use it for your warm. Use it for your skill challenge and then use it for your games you're playing and that's really important. So it'll just make things easier for yourselves when you are setting up. If you have any questions, everyone, please type it into the, uh, the the chat on the side. So we're just going to go through a couple of things. Conditioned games. Bit of a disclaimer here, I suppose. Only play conditioned games on a game or a player to make it better. Not just to make it better or add variety, but make the player better and make the game better. Don't just put a condition on the game to add variety. That's something that we might do a lot of and try to keep changing games for the sake of changing games. Only do it that there's an outcome for it that you want to improve a player or improve a team or improve some sides of a game. That's very important, that you're not just changing the game for some variety. So just some uh, examples of conditioned games here we talked about earlier. Three seconds on the ball, two plays. Um, award extra points. That's really important. Award or extra points for the skill you're really focusing on. So my final goal in the game, you were getting extra points for blocking, you were getting extra points for scoring goals, always adding up points and scores. Kids love getting scores and points, very, very important on the high catch, things like that. On the move, what does that mean? Always take the ball on the move. No statues. When they get the ball, they have to head on with their four steps and get their head up. Whether they take a play after that, whether they take a, a solo or give a pass, but that they're on the move all the time. And that, that's a big thing with, with under eight and 10 players, that they're always standing up and waiting for that ball. And even under 12 players, that they're waiting for that ball to come to them. That they're taking the ball on the move and they're driving on. Look at any good player. They drive on, they break tackles and they play heads up football. Giving goals, another one, they give the ball and they look for the support and keep their run going. No straight ball is another one there that you have to play the ball at an angle. And that's really hard for defenders to work at. So if you keep playing the ball at, at an angle down the field, you're going to end up in the middle of the goal. And that's where you want to be. Finally then, first touch. So if you want to work on their catching in the game, either maybe give them the extra points for their catch, but also you can penalise. If, if they don't catch the ball straight in the chest, free is against them. And they'll think about the next time they get their, their hand position right, their body position right to catch that ball. So that's another condition you can put in. But when you're playing condition games, the big thing is that you're doing it to make the game better and the player better, not just add variety into the games. So we're just going to nip on to the, uh, the, the step activities now. No, yep. John, yeah. So yeah, we, we most of us have probably heard of the step model and um, we use step as an acronym. So as you can see here on, on the slide, S is for space, more or less space. Well, I suppose changing the amount of space available will reduce or increase the difficulty. More space for players means less pressure, but a little bit more running. So again, for example, if we were trying to give the forwards more space, like we looked at in the last number of games, it giving the forwards more space, gives them more opportunity to get the shot away. So again, therefore, you're given, you're changing the game in that regard to give to give the forwards the opportunity to get the shot away if that was something that you were trying to develop. So as we go through all of these, you can see that we can change the game by each step of the way, along the way. So STEP, space, time task, equipment, and personnel. So for time or task, Paddy has gone through some of the conditions there already. So we change the task that the players are required to perform. So again, maybe choose something more difficult to perform. So if you have a player, particularly at underage level, who's maybe your strongest player, and he's dominating the game, well, what do we do with him? Well, you ask him to change the skill of being performed. You can ask him to solo or kick on his weaker side. Other t ways we can change the timer task is maybe nine seconds to score, uh, five seconds to get a tackle in after losing the ball, five passes before you, you take a shot. So again, all along the way, you're changing the game by making very simple alterations to it. For equipment, again, as I can see Damien has here on the slide, the different type of the ball. Again, if you change it from a big ball to a smaller ball, you're, you're changing the whole dynamic of the game. And one thing that I like to do, even in a normal fist passing game, is halfway through the game is to take the size four ball off them and maybe throw in an ordinary tennis ball. You know, it adds dynamic to the game. It adds huge kind of concentration levels. Handling, 
odds of it increases. Another way you could do it is add in a second football. Okay, so again, you're alternate by the, the type of equipment you're using. Going back to the games that Paddy and Damien and myself have put up earlier tonight with equipment, again, we've all used different sizes of goals, maybe having four goals. So again, you're giving them a different opportunity to attack different areas and your game has changed again. For personnel, again, normally we start off, especially with the younger age group, with, with no opposition. Again, by generally or gradually introducing opposition to it, you're changing the game. Firstly, it might be in a token form and then, then gradually, again, progressing on to full opposition. OK, so again, if you look back on some of the games that we've done tonight, we've had 3v3 or 5v5, but you could also weigh it in favour of whatever you're working on. Again, we'll go back to the example of the forwards. If I want to give my forwards more opportunity to get a shot away, I might weight the game in the favour in favour of the forwards. For example, five forwards against two backs. OK. So, in all games that we've gone through tonight, or all games that you would have be, f be familiar with, this type of a model can be used. Like, for the video I have done there today and a video that we've done last week, I sat down and used the step model. I have not used every game that myself with my players or in the last number of years that are on the activities there tonight. But by sitting down with the step model and, and taking up different tasks, I was able to come up with more games. Very simply. So as a coach, you have to see what's going wrong in your games or what do you really want to work on with your players. And sit down and use the, this simple acronym of STEP and say, well, how can I change this game? You know, we all as coaches at times go out and try and find a game, find a game, find a game, find something new. Well, often it is the games that we already have and the alterations that we make can actually help the players and help you. Okay, so as, as you see this problem, Again, ask yourself the questions, what can I do? How can I use the step model to adopt this game and to make it better and to get more for the players that are there in front of us? Deli, John, thanks for that. So uh, again, just going on the step and John said he, he sat down and he created games and like there could be nine or 10 different variations of each game. And when you sit down yourself and look at your games, you'll do that. So it's a very important model to use. Just going back to the start and our terrorist principles, which is very important to all our coach education and our, our sessions we use on. Every game has we've looked through the terrorist principles and this is something as a checklist for you as a coach going out. If you can have that on your session plan before you go out, maybe to check off, did I test and, test and challenge the players? How do they do it? How do they challenge the best player in the team? How do they challenge the weakest player in the team? There are different ways of doing that. Did they make it individual to them? Did they give them different conditions or did they, did they give them individual feedback? Really, really important. Was it game based? And tonight is all about games based playing, but it's also about making individual to the players. So that's very, very important. Was there loads of touches and loads of decision making in the in, in your activities? Games create loads of decisions. Having loads of footballs and loads of small set of games creates loads of touches. So there's your there's your answer there. And finally, is it fun? As Paddy said at the start, you want to be the coach that your players remember that they enjoyed their session and their challenge. And if kids are stimulated and challenged they'll enjoy the session and they'll remember it and that's really really important so just going to nip on to the next one here is that we've only went through the step model tonight and we've went through about 10 or 12 different games what i target every coach here tonight is pick your own three favorite games sit down use a step model and create nine or ten different ways of playing that game and you're used to doing that and used to setting it up and your players are used to it, and you can just change it so using that step model to create maybe nine new games yourself other areas that we're going to we that we didn't look at tonight but are really important for the child player is the fundamental movement skills. We just touched on that in the chasing games. Spot and fix and technique is very, very important. And how to get the most out of your session through planning your sessions. And finally, the how to coach skills. So these are just areas that we're looking at to provide for you as coaches. And the idea of tonight is, is that when we go back to our clubs, whenever we get back, that our, our, our sessions are better planned, there's, there, there's better vision and better targets what we're going to try and do with our players and we've better footballers at the end of the day and more enjoyable training sessions. So these are other areas we need to look at and these are things that we'll be asking you during the next couple of weeks to look at that, that you'd like us to look into and help you with. So again, fundamental movement skills, spotting and fixing and how to get the most out of your session. So what Damien is going to do now, he is going to go through um, how you get into the resource. So we've all the videos up online. 
all the session plans up online and we have an extra resource there with over 29 different games that you can use with your players down down through the, the age groups, all the way from under 8 to under 12. And again, to everyone, if you have any questions, throw it up there in the text box. There's a couple up there, I think, at the minute. Um, yeah, John, is there any questions there? But it's again, if you look back on the videos and the resources David's going to show you now, you'll get loads out of it and say it'll make things better when you go back to your players in the future. Is that okay, David? Yeah, <clears throat> ideal. Thanks, Paddy. Yeah, so firstly, before I go any further, I'd just uh, really like to thank Paddy and John for carrying tonight through. Uh, done a super job and a lot of work put into this. And we've had over 70 people online, which is huge. And obviously, people have a thirst for, for learning. So that's great. Uh, hopefully, you got something out of it. So just wanted to direct you towards our own um, website. Uh, it's called longforga.ie. Up here at the top under coaching and coaching webinars. So this will bring you into the page. Uh, obviously, last week is there, so a recording of it and the resources. But then this week here, so uh, tomorrow I'll put up the recording of today's session and we just stick it in there. You can download it yourself. And then this is the resource from everything from today. So again, um, all you have registered for whatever of these that suit you most, either three and four or whether it's just today. So um, that's fine. I'll be making contact with you. But if you have any club mates or anything like that that want to join in, just get them to click the link here and complete it. So then the resource, you just click on there. And it'll open up to a, a shared document. And then we have everything there. So there's my folder, John's folder, Paddy's folder, um, the other videos with Paddy there at the beginning. And then there's the main resource itself, uh, as Paddy has referenced with, I think it's 29 games in total that's in that. So if you just click on that, it'll open up and um, you can also download it and save it forever in a day. So uh, I'll just hand you back to um, Paddy and John, see if there's any questions there. We've only got a couple of minutes left. So if anyone has any, any questions, just pop them in and uh, we'll try and get them answered. And um, yeah, ho again, hopefully you all enjoyed the night. Cheers, Damon. Um, I suppose just another thing just to, to focus on here and you're probably saying to yourself, how can we run all these games at a session? And if we don't have enough football between one, between two, maybe an easy way for you as a coach to, um, to separate your sessions is have a game area and have a skills area. So you might have to mark out your, your 40 by your 60 by 40 pitch for your, for your game, have your game going on there and then have another section for working on your skills maybe. So all you need is your one football, maybe two footballs for your mini game. And then on the side, you can have four or five footballs and the players working on technique sort of stuff and you can rotate them around through the session. So you don't have to have 20 to 30 footballs to do all these games and these activities, but you can just use your equipment wisely, which is really important. And I know a lot of you, when you're training, you all train at the same time with your 8s, 10s, 12s on the same pitch and there's not a lot of space. So ideally, mark out your pitch first and work from there. But the first thing you should always do is Damien done in his game. He just had a pitch marked out and you play from there. So that, that, that's really, really important when you're cutting through. Just a couple of questions there, I think. Uh, click up on it here. You know, um, John, anything else to add there, John, just on the games and the, the variety and of the condition of games or anything else like that? No, I think you've, you've been fairly well covered there, Paddy, but I suppose just to take up on, on what you're after saying about, about the setup, again, as you said, it's, it's very important that and any coach is that you have your your few distinct areas set up from the very beginning that you as you said if you have your skills area you have your games area side by side it's very easy then to alternate between them if you're doing it in two groups or even to move a group from one side to the other again and that's just ease of movement and ease of coaching for everybody there as well so just the, the basic setup or the initial setup with these games you know is crucial at the beginning of a session but again it's extremely simple to set up and once you have it, it, the session will flow very simply for you. Just a question there from Katrina. How long will the resources be available on the website? Katrina, they'll be on the website for, for as long as we can, I suppose, unless the website change. But we'll, we'll, that'll be an ongoing resource, and it will be changed as time goes along. But the resource will be up there all the time for yourselves. Um, and I suppose, finally, just Damien would have mentioned it last week. Obviously, at this moment in time, we don't have a lot of football and stuff going on, but we're open for business and open for, I suppose, things to help you with. So we sent out a survey to clubs a couple
couple of weeks ago and stuff that we want we, we we see we could help you with but also these these webinars would have came out of that we have the current webinars coming up at next couple of monday nights but if there is other areas in which we can help you in regarding your coach and all the skill challenges and stuff are on the website there as well and all the stuff we put up on twitter and facebook and any idea just come on to us and say to us and we'll try and help you as the best i can with them sort of activities um another thing i suppose what you might think of doing just to finish up on is for your players at the minute, maybe start sending them out. Some of you might be doing already, send them out activities and skill challenges. There's loads up on Twitter there and on Facebook and Instagram and things. And we're doing a good bit with squads and, and clubs have sent out different things. But maybe just to send out some challenges to your players, which would be very, very good. I think to, to get them, keep them moving, keep them entertained. Again, if you need any help on that, come back to us. It's all in the resources there anyway from this week and last week. And just trawl the website. But any questions you have on that, just come back to us. And, and finally, I suppose, I'd like to thank John and Paddy for their contribution and Damien for the games. I thought they were really, really good. And I say, I hope you got something out of it. And um, I say, if anyone has any feedback on the session or anything, please come back to us on how the, how the session went, what, what we would like more of and less of and how you think it would work better. It would be really great for us to see going forward. So, John, anything else? No, and I just suppose just you've touched on it there as well. And from my point of view as well, just to like to thank Damien and Paddy for this um it's not an easy time for the lads in the office either and it's a huge amount of time went into this from Damien and Paddy in particular and Kieran in the background as well setting up this webinar so lads it's great it's it's fantastic to be able to, to log on and to make a contribution to this and I know coaches are really appreciative and as Damien said there's a thirst for knowledge out there so lads keep up the great work that you're doing there in, in Pierce Park and in the office and hopefully sooner rather than later we'll all be back on the field doing a bit of coaching and back up doing what we, we want to be doing deadly john thanks for that okay we're just going to sign off again just a reminder for next monday and um, we have the youth and adult coaches 13 to 18 year old where we provide a group of a bank of snc resources and show you how to use them with your team so looking at the snc and athlete development type mm -hmm. situation for your club so that's the next um webinar next monday night and then the following monday the 27th is for the nursery coaches for coaches from four to six so we'll provide a resource for you there but also how to run your nursery session how to get the best out of it and how to get parents involved and and and, and uh, upskill your coaches and parents at that age group so they're the next two monday nights we, probably, we will have another couple of other things coming down the line but again if you have any ideas yourselves or or questions for us don't be free afraid to contact myself damien owen or kieran or Seamus or any of the lads there just to, to give you a hat, dig out on, on changing things up and planning for the future. So other than that, everyone, thanks very much and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.